So a couple things. One, the conversation we wanted to make sure, and there's a few of them happening in the next um, two days. One also happened this morning, another panel. Um, we really want to kind of explore different models for funding some of these ventures, um, other than venture capital. And it's not to say that venture capital is bad, because you know, like as an entrepreneur, I've certainly enjoyed. Uh, the support of venture capitalists, and um, I also have been an investor in many companies. It's more the, the idea that um, not every company or every project is appropriate for venture. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly from our perspective, that the whole idea of the collaborative economy um, invites this whole other notion of equitable distribution and participation. Um, my way of talking about it is that there's value creation, and people who are founders, for example, or investors create a certain amount of value. And then there's value capture, and the VC model is designed in a particular way so that the investors capture a lot of value, um, as opposed to another model, for example, with Jonas Salk, you know, where Dr. Salk invented the polio vaccine. and he decided to open source it rather than create a pharmaceutical company. Um, and people estimate that he gave up $7 billion in value, financial value, but, but optimized for a different kind of value, uh, social capital and, and you know, global health. So, um, so that kind of prompted us to, uh, and for me to bring together a collection of very talented characters uh, to look at how companies are being funded um, and um, what they're thinking about the creation of the company, how that matches the way that they're deciding who are the right sorts of investors, and then what that means about the exit. Um, so including, like, should these companies exit? Because if they're owned by the community or the people, um, what does that look like? So to join me today. <laughs> We have um, Janelle Orsi, who you may re recall from this morning, still in the same lovely outfit. Um, Janelle is uh, the f uh, one of the founders of the Sustainable Economics Law Center. She's an attorney, um, and she is shockingly, and this should be tweeted, not the only Janelle in the room. Uh, Dan Danielle Applestone is a fa founder of a company called um, other machine company that's part of Other Lab. And, um, and Danielle is an entrepreneur and uh, has a very deep science and technology background. Um, and their company story is very uh, different, a, a whole different way to approach um, designing products, testing products, building teams, and growing capital. And then, never thought I'd have to say this, but Janelle number two. Oh. <laughs> We're equal. Jan Janelle Kelman, um, also an, a lawyer, but not acting as one at the moment, um, a, a founder of a company called Kit Order um, that actually uh, creates community and supports sports, really, uh, and sporting teams. And she can explain more about the company. But the similarity here is that we're looking at really kind of um, thoughtful and inventive ways to um, you know, test and model uh, how companies are built and how capital is created. So, <clears throat> Janelle Kelman, can you? Um, so, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody who's here and these folks for being on part of the panel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Kit Order, what it is, and um, if you want to, why you started it, but also um, how you've gotten it this far from a funding perspective? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Janelle Kelman. I'm older, apparently, so I get to be number one, She's I think. the original. Yeah, the original. <laughs> um, so my company is called Kildor.com. Uh, it is a uh, SaaS-based technology platform uh, to facilitate e-commerce for teams and groups. And our tagline really is creating commerce around community. So throughout our lives, we see people with shared common interests. It could be a kickball league. It could be uh, cheerleading. It could be a corporate group. Uh, it could be a fundraising event. 
And those folks uh, at some point in time want to feel a greater sense of community. And one way that they do that is to connect through uh, identification um, with similarities. And what I mean by that is the same t-shirts, right? The same uniforms. And uh, as an athlete growing up, I found that that team dynamic really created very strong um, community, very strong belief in one another. And it's something we try to replicate uh, at the e-commerce level. Uh, I've often sort of described the company as sort of a box within a box because uh, at the micro level, we're creating micro sites uh, for teams and groups that want to be able to transact around their shared interests. We primarily sell uh, our product at an enterprise level to companies whose customers are actually these groups of people. But we also have a site that's available for any type of individual who wants to go to just kidorder.com and, and create one of these micro sites as well. And uh, so can, can you give us an example? Like, uh, you, do you mean like a soccer team? Or? Sure. Like, um, let's take uh, maybe you're a soccer dad or a soccer mom, and your kids have to uh, wear the same outfit as everybody else on the team. Um, they also need to get shin guards and cleats and so on. And so uh, normally it's you know the kid coming home from school or practice with a spreadsheet that's all crumpled up and sweaty and dirty and in the back pocket and getting a check from mom or dad and coming back into the coach and the coach is using pen and paper. Right? And our, our system is meant to facilitate that. But it goes way beyond just athletics really into um, helping people connect with one another when they have a shared interest. So we see a lot of sites created for fundraising. I want to do the Susan G. Komen uh, 10K run. I want to do a Challenge Athletes Foundation bike ride. Um, how do we come together either to handle the registration or, again, this, the similar apparel? Um, and I started it really just to solve an issue that I was having as an athlete. I'm a cyclist. Um, I was leading a 90-person cycling team. I was a, a racing at the time. And uh, I had 90 people emailing me and telling me, this is what I want, and the check's in the mail, and it just was horrendous. Um, but what I found was that it was relevant, again, across athletics, across communities. It's relevant for neighborhoods. And so one of the ideas, actually, that Lisa and I have been talking about for many years now is how can we um, leverage this platform to make it easier for neighborhoods to actually come together to either share resources or even to do group purchases um, and to facilitate that type of interaction within micro communities and larger communities. And so you funded the, um, so far, you funded the platform that's right. So um, initially, yeah, so I was, I was practicing environmental law at the time. Um, I did a lot of renewable work for years. And I thought, well, this is just my own issue. I'll just, I'll just go ahead and figure out you know, what I would do, what I would want it to look like. And I uh, took some money on my bank account and partnered with a, uh, with a developer. And we built something up. And one of the really wonderful things about bootstrapping is that you don't build extra features that you don't need. And you also get a lot of feedback from communities as to what is relevant to them. And so I know this is about creating value and how you find that value. I think that our product is where it is and as good as it is because we bootstrapped, because we were able to say, this is actually essential to this action or this function or to this community, and that's why we're going to build it. We're not going to build it just because we can and we just have extra money kind of hanging around. OK, great. Danielle, can you fill us in on other company and where you magically made money appear from? <laughs> it's definitely magic. Um, hi, I'm Danielle, and <clears throat> I started our company as a project, which came from, a, it was basically a DARPA-funded project for education. I think about the origin of our company actually as kind of like the ultimate crowdfunding. Like when you get government funds, it's from everyone, so like all of you, in fact helped support our company in some sort of weird, you know, twisted way. Um, but I think that it's important because, you know, we, we started because DARPA wanted um, desktop-sized machines to teach kids manufacturing. So bringing industrial technologies down to a small scale and making it manageable to get kids excited about hands-on engineering and get them exposed to what does it look like to control a computer or control a machine with a computer to cut a thing. And you know, we did some development with DARPA, and that was really a good experience for us. We ended up, you know, because that funding for that that project um, was removed during the sequester, so that was kind of a drawback, but it, it forced us to, to run a Kickstarter campaign. So it was like, first was the ultimate crowdfunding with um, government money, and then second was a Kickstarter campaign where you know, we 
put our machine, and this is a, it's a 3D cutter, so it cuts 3D objects out of um, rigid materials like wood and metal and whatever you put in there. Um, so we put our 3D cutter up on Kickstarter and we got great response. And actually this, um, this weekend will be Maker Fair, and that's one year from when we like launched our Kickstarter campaign. And I looked around at the team of people that were, you know, that were in the office on Monday, and it was like, wow, there's 15 of us now. There was nothing like a year ago. Like we had a prototype and a promise, and like, but um, it was really only the DARPA funding and then the Kickstarter campaign that really kept us going and allowed us to basically begin what we believe is the beginning of like, you know, it's the it's manufacturing, small batch manufacturing revolution in terms of providing hardware, and we also do software to people. Um, one of the interesting things is we we then raised venture funding. So we did kind of the whole the whole gamut of dealing with different types of people and different constraints and expectations. And now we're to the point where we are sustainable and we were able to go to a model which looks more traditional. Um, but there's no way we could have gotten there without aspects of crowdfunding, whether it's government or Kickstarter. So it's really it's it's such an interesting transition for us. But yeah. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. That's um, a really good story and very different from Janelle's path. Um, you know, so we know who, a little bit about who we're talking to here. How many of you consider yourselves entrepreneurs? Okay, and and how many of you are, um, you know, entrepreneurs actively right now running a company, or starting a company or project? Okay, great. And hold your hands up for, keep them up for one sec. How many of you are venture funded right now? Yes. Okay, great. So one. Oh no, you were just, you didn't have caffeine at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's a lot of possibility out there. Yeah, so, um, and then for those of you that aren't um, admitting that you're entrepreneurs but you didn't raise your hand, um, are you, um, you know, quietly incubating projects in your mind, or so are there people who are planning on starting something who haven't started it yet? Okay. Cool. Is there somebody that who's a category that you want to, you just want to raise your hand and I didn't <laughs> say something? <laughs> Great. What, what what's the category? Support staff? Yeah, operations. Operations. Okay. Meaning like that that's the role that you play. Okay, that's good. That's a good point. Okay, so who is uh, also on the operations side? Excellent. See, you're not the only hand. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, so, so listen, the, for us the conversation just to be clear, you know, with respect to the sharing or collaborative economy, we're in a process. The movement is you know, not in its infancy, but not like it, it, it's not mainstream. And um, what we've seen happen a lot is um, financing has taken sort of uh, the, the first wave of companies, many of them, especially the ones that are top of mind, are those that have gotten venture capital. Um, and what we're thinking about and exploring is is two pieces of it. One, how do you create the capital? Where, where do you go to look creatively for capital um, that where you're, in the case of Danielle, not yet something that venture capitalists will support so you can do your defining and refining of your business model in other ways? Or in the case of um, Janelle, you know, maybe you're never going to take venture capital. You might never need it, correct? Well, Got full disclosure, we're actually starting to look, <laughs> but um, yeah, we we didn't uh, we didn't want to go that path initially. It has a lot of constraints, particularly if you feel like you have a vision and potentially a strong personality. Maybe I have that, um, <laughs> and, and you and you want to grow that. And you want to do it in a certain direction, and I also think it's important, especially for the share economy, to create profitability, because I think if we can create value in the sense of real numbers and digits, and I think people start to take us a lot more seriously and understand where we're going with this, that it is something that can succeed. And so I think um, profitability is not something to be overlooked when you are actually looking at your business plan. I always ask uh, future entrepreneurs, well, what's your revenue model? How will you make money? 
because it is important for your overall sustainability. So, and, the, and so the piece, there's one piece which is running the business and the other part has to do with, you know, sort of when you take venture capital um, investment, there's a, you know, very explicit expectation that there'll be an exit. And so, you know, we were speaking earlier, um, Matthew and some other folks in a, in a related conversation earlier in the day that, um, you know, so f just as an example, the entrepreneurs that are in the room, how many people here are confident that venture capital would be, would provide the perfect exit for your business model? Okay. <laughs> so that's why we're having this conversation is, is essentially, um, my view is <clears throat> the, the beginning, the, the first companies to come out, um, uh, and I think I gave this example earlier, but I can't recall, that, you know, like for, we started a foot photography company called Ophoto in 1999. Um, I raised $60 million of venture capital money, um, which is a lot of money by today's dollar, you know, in, 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 adjusting appropriately. Um, the thing is that in 2006, when I looked at starting another company and did the math of what it would, what it would cost to start Ophoto in 2006, seven years later, any guesses what the number was? One and a half million. No, it's less, but way less. What, yeah, it was between one and a half and two million dollars. So, you know, we're looking at less than 5% um, required. And what happens, and, and I think you heard earlier today Brad Burnham from USV, from Union Square Ventures, talking about skinny platforms. And what happens is that the first, you know, one to ten companies that have to build platforms and business models and, and, you know, wrestle the alligator of the press and train people on what the collaborative economy is and fight with the regulators and all that kind of stuff, they spend a lot of money. But they make it a lot cheaper for those who follow. And so those of us who are now going to start things are in a really different kind of position. Um, and we can leverage actually what's gone before us. We can learn from the models and basically copy a lot of, um, you know, stealing is the new sharing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can basically copy uh, what people have done before. So, so I think that, you know, what we're realizing and what we're seeing and the reason we wanted to have this conversation with you guys is that um, the opportunity is to create different kinds of exits because we can create different kinds of capital uh, structures. And so um, Janelle has been spending, as you know, she's already confessed, a lot of time looking at um, T corporations, which is the legal um, entity, but essentially cooperatives. And, um, and so do you want to say anything before we kind of delve into conversation and questions and yeah. fighting, hopefully, with each other? Yeah, a few things have popped up, and one of them is because Dan from Dan from Solar Mosaic was going to be here talking about equity crowdfunding. So I thought I'd also just share that when I co-founded the Sustainable Economies Law Center with another attorney, Jenny Casson, she was a securities lawyer, and I never thought of securities law as being a social justice issue. But securities really dictates where people can invest their money and where they from where they can take investment. And in that respect, it dictates the flow of wealth in society completely. And so. Now we have a federal crowdfunding law that's soon to be implemented, we hope. A handful of states have recently adopted crowdfunding laws. California has one right now, AB 20, AB 2096, um, which could use some improvement, truthfully. But um, it's going to just open up huge doors to receiving capital from wide varieties of community members. And so whether or not something is structured as a cooperative or a T corporation, you know, a company like yours, Janelle, has potentially soon very like wide um, wide variety of opportunities to receive capital from community members, from athletes, from the people either who use the site or who may use the site in the future or just think it's really awesome. So um, yeah, and I think we can also take a cue from the community supported agriculture movement because the idea there was people were recognizing it's it's hard to farm. It's hard to get the capital to start a farm. So what if consumers uh, more or less adopt a farm, even adopt a farm before it has planted its vegetables by buying a share of the vegetables 
in advance. So the, the farmer and the consumer share in the capitalization, they share in the risk to a certain extent, because if, it, if it's a bad harvest year, it's not going to be as many vegetables. But they share, in a sense, in the profits, because if it's a good harvest year, they'll, they'll both enjoy that. So, um, but anyways, I think as we're creating new companies, new platforms for the sharing economy, we can do so with that community-supported su frame of mind. If we, as a movement, as a community of people, say, this is a platform that I want to have uh, in the sharing economy, then we can sort of wrap around it and support it like that and agree to join it before it's even started or finance it uh, by you know, making a microloan or an equity investment. Um, but cooperatives keep coming to me as being a solution for so many reasons. and. Um, reasons that I spoke quite a bit about this morning, and I think a lot of you heard. But um, I guess a little bit more, I mean, less about why cooperatives and a little bit more about how. I do think that the current context enables them so much more uh, because of the potential to crowdfund and because of just technology and the amazing ways that we can account for things. And so if you have a platform where um, the users are the owners, and you want to reward them for the various ways in which they're participating. You could calculate their share of the dividends from the company. You know, they'll, they'll receive dividends from the company, but it could be on the basis of uh, how much money they generated for the company, uh, how many members they recruited for the company, how much they participated in the forums or came to community events, uh, whether they voted in elections, uh, whether they wrote customer reviews that got good thumbs up. You know, all of these things that are good behaviors that create a vibrant community could help people accumulate points. So it's the new measure of people's value that they create and that they contribute. Uh, it's not just money, but then if to the extent that there is money generated through the system, you can distribute it back to the users on that basis and it creates a whole different set of incentives and motivations and it redistributes the wealth in society, which is really um, what we need to do. And then the, the governance of it, it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges that need to be sorted out, and I think um, everybody in the room is probably going to have different ideas about how to set something up um, as a democratic organization, uh, as a cooperative. But they're, like the company that I'm working with, Lokonomics, it, you know, we're having a lot of questions right now about like, what if this becomes huge? How do we take nominations for the board of directors? Because you know, REI is a cooperative. Um, but the board of directors nominates the next board candidates, and then they go ask the members, who do you want to vote for? Which is not, you know, you don't actually have a real opportunity as a member to influence things. But um, so, so we're trying to think. Like I don't like that model. But we're trying to think about how do we actually meaningfully give people the power to say nominate board members without it because you know without losing control. So there's a lot of interesting questions. I'll just leave it at that. But, so yeah. so I think, you know, what one of the things that I'll say, and by the way, I just got this secret note that says if you have a blue Tesla plate number, no. It says um, I'm supposed to repeat the questions that we asked before <laughs> to the audience. Um, but I don't remember what the questions were. So um, who here is, that, the, the ones about who's an entrepreneur? Is that what I'm supposed to be doing? I guess there's a live cast audience who wants to participate in answering the questions. Or so, oh. maybe if people in the crowd. Sorry? Ask the questions. Oh, you mean when we get to ask yeah, the audience? Oh. Got you. <laughs> so the blue Tesla thing was just a joke. <laughs> All right, never mind. Thank you. Um, right, so, so one of the things um, is, you know, we're kind of, you could, there's a scenario where there's two paths, right? There's one that's really well understood. You could just get on 280 in the case of the Bay Area, drive down Sand Hill Road, and there's one venture capital office lined up after the next. Um, and so if you go down that path, it's well understood. Um, it doesn't mean that everything fits into that model, but it's well understood. If you go down the other path, you need to get like a compass and a machete and uh, you know a little headlamp and whack the crap out of some things until you figure out you know what really is working and who's responding to your 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 pitch and your ideas. And I think that um, from my perspective as an entrepreneur, you do that all the time anyway. You know, you do that with respect to who your audience is, how your product matches, 
um, who potential partners are, and all those sorts of things. Um, and so in this model, we're just saying, hey, we're really early in the collaborative economy. Let's, um, let's experiment. We're experimenting with ideas uh, for the basis of these models and businesses, like Danielle's got this really cool machine sitting there that, you know, it's pretty sophisticated and it's, it's unassuming, but it's really a sophisticated machine. Um, you know, that's kind of a surprise and that's a very powerful offer. But the, so we tend to be very focused on what's the core offering of the business and less um, focused on how we're funding and who's our, on our board and who's going to benefit from this and how is the distribution work and, you know, the, the things of really kind of um, what I'll call the ethos of the business. So, you know, I, I, I think that for us, um, especially, and, and I guess I'll represent Dan Rosen, who's sorry he couldn't be here. He's the co-founder of Solar Mosaic, uh, which is a crowdfunding s platform to, for clean energy. So they um, basically offer clean energy projects, and people like you and I give loans so it's prosper for clean energy. Um, and basically, they funded initially with um, grants from the, the, the um, Sunshot and similar grants from the government as well, so crowdfunding, uh, a la Danielle's example. And they also won a million dollars from a Verizon competition. And so you'll, you'll also see that many corporations, especially now, are sticking a toe in the water uh, by trying to kind of find people and partners um, to do interesting things with. A lot of big corporations are taking the point of view that innovation is going to happen outside the walls of their company and that the most innovative thing that they can do is open up as a platform and invite um, third-party companies to you know, pitch them on cool ideas. Uh, so to that end, Solar Mosaic um, won a big award, which was great. Um, they also did ultimately uh, take venture capital money, but they took it from uh, well-humored um, people who are deep in solar, and so they feel that you know, they're going to they're gonna have patient capital. Uh, so I, I offer that as background and just suggest that um, because I'd love to have this, I'm hoping that we disagree with each other during the course of the conversation, but I think um, we, I'd love for us to take questions so that we can get some feedback from you guys, I mean, you know, get into a conversation uh, rather than us, you know, tell stories. So does anyone have any um, straightaway questions? Really? You guys are so quiet. Can I tell a story real quick? Yeah, yeah. So this morning, um, uh, it's late coming because I had a meeting with a potential investor. And so one of the things they make you do are these awful slide decks. And then one of the slides has to be, you know, why we win or how are we different in the competitive landscape? Most entrepreneurs will say, oh, we don't have any competition, right? There's no one doing what we do. And he's, he's a little more savvy than that. And he said, well, OK, you guys are e-commerce. So are you like Shopify? And I said, well, well no, because here's the things that we do. And he said, well, OK, this is a comparison. He seems kind of, you guys are both e-commerce. Like, take me further. And he's throwing out different e-commerce names, Magento or Volusion, and what's the difference? And finally, I said, well, you know, we're a community commerce platform. And he said, well, wait a second, what? I said, yeah, <laughs> uh, people use our platform because they can talk to each other on it. They can use uh, social shopping at its leanest, meaning I bought this, maybe you want to buy it as well. You can uh, create notices, you can interact on the e-commerce site while you're engaging in this uh, already group or team dynamic. And he was just so fascinated by that. And it, it felt like the right tone for walking in here today because it seemed like he, he had seen so many other e-commerce platforms and kind of been there, done that. But when I brought up the community aspect of it, the ability to really connect, to be social when you're engaging on a shared interest level, that for him was something that really stood out. And I think that's kind of the new new out there. That needs to happen in more ways uh, on more types of platforms because, as Lisa said, things have already been invented and we're, we're sort of a piggybacking on what's out there. So how can we do it differently and how can we do it within the context of more of a sharing economy and more of a communication economy? And then I, I think that's a great example. I, it, um, it also, so, so keep following the thread and putting you on the spot, um, if, you, if you imagine um, that you have a community commerce platform 
do, does that shape the, the way that you think about um, capital, how you would raise capital, and also who would be an equity shareholder in the company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's sort of two schools of thought. Some people say they're smart money, and some people say all money is smart. Um, so you just have to decide for yourself. Do you feel like you need to be with people who are going to help guide you, or do you feel like if you have the funding that you'll be able to pursue the trajectory that you see yourself in? But either way, I mean, I think you always want to have someone who shares your philosophy and your vision, um, who understands that you're going to put money towards certain projects or certain product development that maybe uh, they wouldn't have seen five, ten years ago because it wasn't important to them. So I think it's always important. But at the very basic level, you know, you should like who you work with, right? And these people are going to become your, you know, pretty much your, your spouse for a while. <laughs> I mean, they're going to be in your face, and so you really do need to enjoy them and see eye to eye and have a good working relationship. Totally agree. Yeah. And Danielle, do you have um, com two things? Um, I'm really interested because I keep staring at that cool machine. Um, <laughs> How did the, how did the um, fact that you crowdfunded the, the mill really, di did it shape the project and the product in a different way? Did it move you in a different direction? Or did you have, is it, you know, the whole thing was conceived and you simply used the money to execute? Um, so actually, this is a completely different machine than the one that we developed for DARPA. So DARPA had a very specific thing that they wanted, which was much more forward-looking um, than, than we thought that the market would, would respond to. Mm. So what we thought was like, OK, we have all this technology. We basically we have this awesome prototype. And we've, we've thought a lot about what is it that we want to accomplish. But we think that this other machine is too soon. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how many machines that we can sell to people who want to make custom circuit boards. So essentially, given the constraint of how many machines can you sell in a month, we built a prototype of something that was just designed. I mean, it, it, the tagline for Kickstarter was custom circuits on your desktop. Knowing that that market's actually really small, it's probably only maybe like $100 million or something. Um, Can you give us an example? Like for, for me, well, I don't really know that industry. Yeah. Like what kind of product would that be interesting for? Um, so there's a lot of people who are designing wearables, yep. essentially. So any kind of des device that has, sensors. has a circuit or sensors in it and maybe has an enclosure like made out of plastic or aluminum or something, people can use this machine to make that. Um, so given that we didn't have any money in the bank and we only had a month, we went in a really narrow direction, just like, OK, if we can tell the story to these people and get the, get the message out there and get good response, we know that we can tell the story to other people. And now that we, you know, so in that way, it totally changed what we wanted to do. Because I wanted to go and make a machine that um, basically would be the first computer controlled machine for the craft market, which is where we are going now, now that we have some traction and, and we can think a little bit more broadly. But in the beginning, I was like not going to go into Michael's and say, here's a CNC machine to cut jewelry or whatever, because that's just too far out. So I think that not having a lot of money in the beginning and having to do something like crowdfunding makes you take little steps. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's like growing a tree slowly. It's stronger um, than if you have to grow really fast and make like big decisions without a lot of data. It's also, I mean, I, I've been early and I've been on time <laughs> or a little, a little early. Uh, it's a lot more fun to, to be a little earlier on time. Um, and I'm, I don't know. Uh, how many of you in the room have, but I'll ask, you know, have people, have you felt that you've launched a project that was just too far ahead? Anyone besides me? <laughs> um, you know, so what happens uh, is, is you run out of either enthusiasm uh, ideas or typically you run out of capital. Um, and the witness protection program, as it turns out, isn't what it's cracked up to be. So, um, <laughs> So the idea of basically bootstrapping something and building, you know, just ahead of what your customers actually want, I think is just a really, um, it's, it's kind of the salt of the earth approach, right? And, and puts you in a very sensible way. Um, so carry on. So then you, you now, because my memory is you had this crazy positive campaign, right? I mean, you set 
What was your what was your goal for Kickstarter? Um, we wanted to sell fifty machines in a month, but we sold two hundred and five machines in a month, um, which was really good for us. Um, and it basically just said, "Oh, okay." To anybody who is a prospective like investor, here's a team. We don't know anything about them, but they executed really well on something that was difficult and sold fifteen hundred dollar machines that don't exist yet. And so they must be good at telling a story, at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and yeah, and you built the things. Yeah. No. And then actually, we built the things, and so it was like. I think also making promises and fulfilling promises in a like a manageable way also gave us credibility, and that's what allowed us to go from government to Kickstarter to venture funding. Yeah, and I really think of you know I think of it as as like the difference between VC or crowdfunding is really how much risk can any one person take, and so you know we have these laws from like the government that say you know you have to make over this amount of money or have this amount of money in the bank before you can make an investment of yeah. X size. And it's a really it's really about protecting the investor, you know, like saying, okay, well, you can take this much risk. If you're just a normal person, you can take fifteen hundred dollars worth of risk on an other mill that may never exist. Like there that is the amount of risk that you can take on Kickstarter. Yeah. And I don't know where that limit is, like for sort of the average person. Um, but I think that's one of the issues is like whether it's someone's risking time or r reputation or money, I think that being able to break risk down into quantities that we can measure and say like, okay, this is this is the amount of risk that's sensible for you at your state in life or yeah, amount of capital. I well, think is really important. Well, and what's on the other side of risk is trust, right? That I mean, I think I'll, each of you talked, um, I mean, and I'm sure that you all have your own um, lens on this. But a lot of what you know has happened in the last five or six years with respect to these businesses, and in general in the tech industry with startups, is this whole idea of you know how do you know who's there? Who do you trust for what? Um, what are you building trust on the basis of? What are they trusted for? Um, people's reputations become, you know, become their primary currency. And, and so I think that you know, risk is, like you said, it's, it's kind of um, it's a step function, right? Uh, the, my way of talking about it is, you, you know, as an entrepreneur, you look at define, refine, and then scale. That you, you know, define a project, iterate, and refine it, and, and then move into a moment in which you scale. One question I have, um, potentially for, for you guys at some moment, but certainly uh, amongst the three of you, is you know, should collaborative economy companies, especially those that are considering alternative sources of funding, should they scale? You know, like, um, does it make sense to have a lot of local players that come together as a sort of an affiliation, um, whether that's a places to stay or transportation or food services, or do we, you know, just fund a company and and allow that company to have a global brand in sort of the old school last century way? Um, do you do you all have an opinion about that? I have a I have an opinion. Please, <laughs> we talked. I mean, we talked about this the other day. Is like yeah. If you're if you're growing a company, there's or if you're starting a company, there's this expectation that you will grow. But I think that you have to decide what to own and how big to get. And I think that there's kind of this this pattern where a company with a good idea like explodes and gets really huge and like sort of grabs all of the the space in the market and grabs all of the competitors and either buys them or squashes them. And then they're left with this big pile of cash that they must then redistribute to places that they, you know, whether it's philanthropic or now they have a venture fund or something and they're seeding small companies. But instead, if they had just chosen not to grow in the same fashion and let those small seedlings grow up and be competitors or whatever, it would be much more robust of an ecosystem for one. And there's always losses. Like anytime you grab the money and then have to decide how to spend it, you're losing a percent every time that you do that. And so yeah. in, in my opinion, decide what to own, decide what kind of company you're gonna be, and do that from a scope perspective, not necessarily a money perspective, and then let the rest go because you don't need all that. 
Well, it's funny because the mo <clears throat> the mentality from last century was, you know, get big and integrate and kill competition and barriers to entry and all that kind of like rough and tough military language. Um, I was just reading this piece about the utility companies, essentially, and, and the way that electricity happened in the United States. And the short version is that you know Edison actually really wanted a lot of competition. He felt that competition was going to make the whole environment so much better. Like innovation would thrive if you have competition. If you don't have competition, it doesn't. Um, and then it turned out that um, his kind of chief of staff uh, took a different point of view, went to Chicago, and negotiated deals with regulators so that he would be protected if he built out a bunch of distribution. And that monopoly really still is in place today. So, you know, we have, and there's a lot of different examples, but you see where there's a lot of regulation and a lot of protection, there's also very little innovation. Um, and a related story, uh, when I was in Brazil recently and had a chat with um, this person who's the Minister of Culture and Education, uh, Brazil as a country about six years ago took the point of view that they were going to bias and, and embrace open source across the board. So I asked, you know, why are you doing that? And the answer that came back was, well, you know, we're moving from a developing country we're coming from behind. Um, what we want to do is actually enable and throw gas on the fire of innovation. Um, we're very interested in generating as much um, value creation as possible. We're not very worried about value capture because we think that that will happen in time. And so what we want to do is reduce the friction to to innovate. We want collaboration. We want massive co-creation. We want people to kind of go to the gym and build their muscles, learning how to work and think together. Um, and we want them to open source big ideas so that innovation can spread really rapidly. Um, and my observation is actually, and probably yours as well, Brazil is a pretty impressive place as a country, um, and it's changed dramatically, um, economically, education, um, technology startups, all, in, in lots of different uh, industries and a lot of different metrics, you could see uh, the kind of growth that's taking place there. And, and I think a, lo a big part of it is a function of this idea that, um, you know, we, ideas are free. We want to we work together. We want innovation and creativity to flourish. Um, so what do you guys, I want somebody to argue with me. You guys aren't going to argue, are you? Uh, I'm not going to argue, no. Um, <laughs> I think there's a balance to be had, right, for, I mean, competition also drives innovation, right? And so I've always wondered why, why the phrase has been the share economy. Because what you're talking about it doesn't really lend itself to economics or to, to economic principles, right? It's a whole different way of looking at it. And I sort of wonder why that came to be the phrase for how we describe so many of these businesses. Right, we're talking about um, smaller groups that do a lot of the same thing. We're talking about open source information. We're talking about collaboration. We're not talking about um, you know, the open capital markets finding out what makes the most sense. Yeah. So I just I wonder, I mean, you've been here from, the, from sort of the beginning of this um, uh, innovation. So why, why do you think it started to be known as the share economy? Well, actually, there's a lot of controversy about the, the name. Um, people, everybody, you know, not everybody, but there, I think everybody probably who's in this room knows that the, the collaborative economy, the pure economy, the invisible economy, the sharing economy, all, it goes by a lot of different names. And I think um, part of the reason is that I, the sharing economy, for me, I used it initially in whenever that was, 2008. Um, because I was seeing a shift from ownership towards this, this idea that assets would be shared. And my, um, I was trying to lead the witness, unsuccessfully, I might add, um, as an entrepreneur, that, that instead of venture capitalists funding you know, our four businesses, and we do really different things, but, but four of the platforms that we build and spend a lot of our money on are actually, at the core, very similar, let's say. So there's no incentive for us to share that technology 
each of us goes off with our own teams and rebuilds the same technology. So inventory management and community management and outward facing messaging and um, back end e-commerce cart man, you know, all of these things are, are tend to get built over and over. Um, so my view was, you know, if we could actually acknowledge that and make a commons of here's a collection of technologies, tools, assets um, that we want to actually as a community share. And then we each become members of something. Um, my, my thing at the time was the instigator collective. And so the idea was, you know, let's join something so that we can all kind of use these tools. We could dress them up how we want to. Um, so I was looking at how can we amplify the, this aspect of sharing that lowers the cost of experimentation and innovation, uh, increases the velocity of kind of refinement and adoption, um, and would accelerate the maturation of the life cycle of moving from the old economy to whatever this is. Um, and so that was why I was using sharing. I think that um, because the, a lot of the businesses, A, you know, uh, if you weren't here this morning, you know, there's about $5 billion in venture capital that's gone into these companies so far. Five of the companies have uh, $2 billion of that. So, you know, my concern was like, okay, the, the model is such that it's very much moving to, towards, you know, this old form of distribution. Um, there was a lot of heat that, that has come on to the phrase the sharing economy in the last year, uh, especially because people were saying like, hey, you know, BS, that's not sharing. You're charging me. And by the way, if it's a $10 billion or a $3 billion, you know, pre-money valuation on this company, where's the sharing? Uh, which I agree with. I mean, that's part of why we're having this conversation. So, so I think the notion of sharing economy and the language itself um, frankly, is something that's come under debate. I'm, I'm a lexicon agnostic in that I don't really feel personally attached to anything except for the outcome. You know, I don't really care, in a way, what we call it. Uh, my, my expectation is that, it, hopefully, in a few years, it will just, as the phrase goes, be called the economy. <laughs> so. I actually always preferred the mesh. The mesh, me too, but I you know. Did. Because I felt like that really highlighted, that's something that Lisa have been working on for a few years now, so it always highlighted the opportunity to fill in each other's sort of the holes that you're having, the gaps that you were experiencing. Because I, I guess as somebody who's built, you know, back-end e-commerce carts, I think there's actually a value in building and rebuilding, rebuilding, because everybody sees it differently, and you build it differently. And through, through that exploration, you have refinement, and maybe you come up with a much better process, even though it looked like exactly the same thing as somebody else was doing. But I love the idea of, um, API integrations and how do we plug in what somebody else is doing to build something even bigger than what we can do on our own. So funny. I never thought until you guys were talking about what exactly I like my thoughts about the sharing economy and what that meant because I think of it in a totally different way. I see it as we are sharing either risk, like sharing risk a bunch of, you know, just like Lyft drivers, right? Yeah. They're all sharing their own cars, right? But to be part of this thing um, that exists that none of them would really do on their own. But it's also sharing in demand. Like I, as one person out there, could you know make a website and go drive people around. But I don't, because I can't get that same amount of demand. And so if we pull together and we share our resources, we share our risk, we also share in the demand. And yeah. so we're taking a portion of that, which I guess, I guess sharing in general is, is much more like giving. This isn't a giving economy. Well, that was why, I mean, so, so, yeah, that's why it came under a lot of heat, that word. I mean, I used it myself to, uh, I mean, selfishly, when I was writing the mesh, for me, I said, you know, to myself, I wouldn't have confessed this publicly at the time, you know, that I consider myself a successful entrepreneur and a failed environmentalist. Um, and so the idea of, basically aggregating demand and supply and yield management, uh, doing yield management on what we have as a planet was a really interesting way to, to make us have less negative impact, right? So, um, 
So that was my entry into the conversation, actually. And so, yeah, it is an aggregation of supply and demand. Um, but, I mean, going back to, you know, I'm just curious, like, does, has everybody, well, let me ask a question. Who here has participated in as a driver host or chef or on the other side in a uh, sleeper driver, uh, sleeper passenger or eater or in, in some of these services? Has, has everybody tried something? So, and, and of those people, um, how, have you done it once and never again? Or who has, who has repeatedly once, once using the service? Okay. Um, after using the services that have been sort of these shared uh, things, who prefers, and you know, I'll close my eyes. Um, who prefers sort of the old school piece? So, you know, taxis or is, is there, I'm just cur curious because I, we, you know, we've had a lot of these conversations of um, risk and trust, trust and transparency and convenience. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that's built into this, plat this, this whole platform. But from the product d d design, and if you guys are looking at you know, participating as entrepreneurs and figuring out how, do you're, gonna, how you're gonna get investment um, for things that you think are not uh, necessarily aimed at venture capitalists or things that you actually don't want a venture capitalist model for. Um, you know, this is the, uh, you know, I would appreciate if you guys could sort of sum up, I have my own opinion, but sum up like what your suggestion is in terms of how people approach this. D is my question but, clear? Yeah, it, but specifically with regard to companies like Airbnb so, so, and the ones you were just talking about. No, no, I mean, I'm saying like, so definitely. let's say that, because I'll pick on Matthew, because I know you. And you're chatty. <laughs> um, can you can you just sort of say as little or as much as you want about what you're doing and um, and where you see the opportunity and the challenge? Sure. Um, I'll start with the opportunity. Okay. okay. So the opportunity. Can you guys hear him? No. Uh, I'll speak up. Can you hear me in the back? Do we have a microphone? Hey, I know, we'll just have a guest chair. Okay. <laughs> so you can be like in the hot seat. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's just schmutz. I don't know what that is. This chair won't do. Hello, hello. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, my so this is Matthew. Um, what, what's the company saying? Uh, working title is mm. Collaborative Advantage, um, which actually came out of Lisa's Mesh conference last year um, for me. At the Mesh conference, I was confronted by, which was essentially this a year ago. That's how I'll frame that. Okay. I was confronted by the fact that um, it seemed that there was a risk that the mainstream world would misunderstand what the sharing economy was and could be. And um, so but you're creating a business that you feel, because from what you, I'm just gathering, this is, we're learning this real time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but wh what I was looking for is, sure. could you sort of, you're, you're in the process of creating a venture that yeah. you believe doesn't, won't fit with the typical. That's right. So basically what we're working on is, uh, we are trying to develop protocols and applications that shift the structure of the internet itself in ways that push power towards individuals, right? Um, this is not a single application, this is not a single service. This is the underlying data structures, the publication and subscription protocols um, that operate in ways where, real simple example, we're trying to create a world where when I look up something, I pull down the attributes that I care about from the sources I trust, filtered the way I want them filtered, presented the way I want them presented. And the mechanism that we're trying to create is that I can pull from resources across the internet any data that I have access to, and I subscribe to 
let's say Janelle, to tell, uh, tell me when I'm looking up stuff about tea corporations, she's a synthesizer. And she's pulling down and directing towards resources that she finds trustworthy and kind of culling from those and presenting them the way, in a specific way. And Lisa's maybe putting a presentation framing around that. And I'm, I'm just subscribing to Lisa. I don't know anything about T Corps, but when I look up that, I'm able to see all of that information filtered and distilled down through the sources that I trust so that when I look up something, I get the information that's relevant to me, that I find reliable, and that's readable for me. And the vision is that with that, I'm able to see six layers, 10 layers deep into supply chains and can take action right now. I can go, do I want to choose A or B? Do I want these blue jeans or those blue jeans? These ones pollute the river and use slavery. These ones <laughs> you know, have air pollution, but it's less. Uh, I could do either of those or neither. You know? And the goal, basically, as, you're, as you were discussing earlier, is how do you put power into people's hands so that they are able to make decisions in line with their own values? If you don't have the capacity, if you don't have the capability, if you don't have that information at your fingertips, you cannot make a decision that is an informed decision. And so we're trying to build the infrastructures that enable that. So, so you're at the root cause. So clearly you don't want to take, where you take money from has a lot of impact into whether, how deeply you can carry out this mission. That's right. Um, and so, you know, what do you see as your options? Well, um, open source is one. Right? It, it, the internet wouldn't be what it is today if HTML and HTTP were something that you had to pay for. Right? Right. And so we're kind of, we're trying what to What was work. that? I said those are open standards, which is different than open Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Kalia. Um, and um, if you have, if you are developing protocols or developing standards, you're not likely to be able to monetize that. Um, or if you do try to monetize. Well, that just piece. in sticking with this theme, so yeah. let me just kind of do more um, honing in. Yeah. Is this a thing that you have to raise money for, or are you putting together kind of a band of pranksters around the world who are going to do this as a volunteer effort, or how? Like from a from the standpoint of the theme of the conversation, building alternative investment uh, approaches. You know what? How does this fit? What, what do you? Yeah. What do you? Um, you know? Do you need capital? And if so, how are you going to get it? I, I think you do need capital because yes, we have the band of pranksters, but those people are having to subsidize their work here on this stuff right. with other work elsewhere, and that limits the amount of bandwidth and time that they can put in. And there, there are a, a number of people. This is an ecosystem of people working on this stuff. I'm not. The center. Sure. Right? I'm a node and um, a, a bit of a connector. But um, I do think that you need to build some business model or business models around portions of this okay. to help accelerate the development of it. And that you do need to go and get access to capital, whether it's grant money or your crowdfunding, or, and it doesn't seem to me that venture capital would be an appropriate source for much of this stuff, but I mean, for certain I mean, things it can be. I mean, let me put a model out. So, yeah. I mean, how many people here have heard of Mozilla Corporation and Firefox? Okay. I mean, the, you know, there's a, essentially a, a model that has, um, you know, it's a, it's a nonprofit that owns a for-profit. It's um, not unique in that respect. They're, but at the same time, you know, they've worked over more than 10 years trying to keep um, you know, the internet operating, which is your point, at a certain level so that the, sh the sharing, especially if we're building technology on top of the internet, to the extent that it remains open, that's a possibility. But to the extent that it becomes like this net neutrality and other issues, I get that. But that's not the topic of our conversation here. The topic, for so for us, yeah. the question is, you know, they could, um, so how many people here, for example, are building, whatever you're building, are you building it on top of the web? Or is it, so who, who needs technology and web-based technology to execute? Okay, and who's doing a, um, a startup where that is not a necessity? Okay, all right, great, thanks. 
So it's definitely the majority of people see the web as, as an, an essential thing. I think the idea, again, I'll just put out the, 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 com the comment that part of what's missing, at least for me, from the collaborative economy is this notion of the commons as a verb, not just as a cute thing to say once in a while in a presentation. But what are the essential components that need to go into our collective commons that we you know, agree on how we're funding it, how we're supporting it, what the rules of engagement are. Um, and I think that, is that, is that my dad? No. <laughs> I, was dad. I was just kidding. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm just saying like, we, that, that, that's an essential piece of what we're trying to do here and we might as well um, highlight that. Um, in the case of just looking at ways in which we are gonna, uh, you know, open up to opportunities around funding, like Danielle, you're looking at, in the future, VC funding into several rounds of funding, or you've raised money and that's kind of it, and what, how do you see it playing out? Well, it really depends on how many machines we sell. So if we sell a lot of machines on the money that we've already raised, we won't need any more. Got it. But you know, there's, you know, people ask me about the possible exits, and what I'd really love is to, kind of go back to the beginning, like maybe IPO, maybe buy back all the rest of the shares slowly, you know, using, using our cash and then be a private company, private employee owned company again or whatever. Um, that's a very long ways away it for is. us. And basically our success is, is determined by what are our margins and how many machines we sell. And, um, you know, do we think that there's a case for expansion will we do better if we raise more money and get bigger yeah um, so it's still the walk before you run like you know like you said before you have to um, make stuff make promises deliver build mm -hmm. trust expand right and mm -hmm. and I think in in everybody's case who's up here and I'm sure everybody in in your seats there um, a realizes that and B is in the process of doing that um, and, and that is in fact you know, one of the best ways to build trust. Um, do you guys, is there anybody who has a question for somebody up here or, around? Oh, good. Can you, can you jump down in? Because we're trying, thanks, Matthew. Sorry, we're going to give you, you know, can you give her that? So we're trying to record the questions, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, I'm Jennifer, Hi. and I have a question um, in regards to venture capital. We've been talking about that in very broad terms, but I'm just curious if there are any observations or experiences between traditional venture capital and what um, we would call more impact investing and funds that are focusing more on social enterprise and trying to make the world a better place and if there's been any, any experiences that you could comment on? Well, I don't think that VC and making the world a better place are mutually, mutually exclusive. exclusive. Yeah, I think that the, the deal is that, at least for us, any VC that I am engaged with, there's a bunch of sort of limited partners that I don't know. I interface with one person, and they have an agenda, and whether it's like, you know, they're very pro-school or they're very pro-hardware or very manufacturing. They have their own agenda. And it's really just about, you know, all of them, no matter if it's trying to help everyone, you know, help help schools or whatever it is uh, with their VC, it's still, there's still this expectation of we got to get our money back. We got to get our money back in like, you know, four to seven years or something like that. Um, and so I think it's not, it's not necessarily has anything to do with what their mission is, but there's this expectation on a return, which is the thing that governs your future in a way. It's like, okay, well, I'm gonna need my money. So like she asked, like, do we raise more rounds of funding later? Well, if my VCs are putting pressure on like, hey, it's been, it's been a while, we need our money back, why don't you raise another round of funding? If that's not the best for our company, we may not have a choice. I, I would say, um, I was just going to say that I think that, um, just to be clear, VCs, are, in my experience personally, are extremely transparent. So it's very clear what they want. 
um, which is the return. The, there are different flavors of VCs. Um, there are people who are, you know, more patient capital. Uh, there, are, a lot of times, the funds are ten-year funds, and when you know, it's very relevant where they are in the life cycle of the fund to where when they invest in your company. So if you're in, if they're in year six or seven of the fund and they invest with you, you know, in year eight or nine, they're going to be out selling their next fund. And they want to see really good. They want to have good stories and good returns by that time because that's what allows them to sell out. You know, the sexiest two words in show business, right? Sold out. It's true for VCs raising funds as well as it is for you know Danielle selling machines and 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 um, Janelle selling, you know, her various kits. I think that. Um, so the bottom line, from from my perspective, is it's it's a dating process. You, there's a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of flavors of capital, and there are um, investors that are very keen on like themes around commerce or or neighborhoods or manufacturing. Um, there are there are VCs that actually want to invest in first-time entrepreneurs uh, that want to have social impact. That there's also you know foundations that are doing some investment as well. So there, there's a lot of different options. Um, and I think it's a, more than anything, it's a challenge. Uh, and the onus is on us as an entrepreneur of, of, you know, basically having more than one option and then choosing, you know, who feels, who feels best at, and also asking the right questions. You know, what, understanding fully what they really want out of the, uh, out of the investment and what the time frame is. Um, you, yeah, you were going to say. Yeah, so, um, something that we've started to do, just to add another layer as you go down that path, is to look at the uh, other portfolio companies for that particular investor. And I think that's a really nice way to be able to determine where you fit in. Because it really is, they do look for sort of a larger ecosystem. Um, one of the really nice things about Google Ventures is that once you're a Google Venture company, you're within that um, larger community and they really have a lot of interaction. So, you know, to the extent that this is a generalization. All investors are looking for a quick return. Um, I think you can really tell a lot about uh, uh, an investor based on what other companies are involved with. You get a real idea of kind of uh, what their uh, priorities are and maybe some of what the exit strategies have been and where you fit into that overall game plan. I also just wanted to say, with respect to that whole venture capital thing, um, a comment that was made in, in an earlier session, um, which is completely my experience, is if any of you ever heard or read the Google IPO documents, the S1s, you know, the founders were very clear about what they wanted and didn't want. And if you recall, um, you may not, that it was actually uh, put out to, to a public market in a different way. It didn't go through the normal retail channels. They, they really tried to do something different. I think that one of the opportunities for all of us is to create such a compelling um, opp opportunity, platform, brand, community, product that, um, that there's something so sexy that you can actually dictate the terms that may be unique to you or your company or your mission or your community. Um, and what you'll discover is that the investors will, will engage with you because you have momentum. You, you are walking the talk, and you, you know, a friend of mine um, is this guy, Blake, who started the company Tom's Shoes. Um, very crazy idea. It's working. Uh, they just launched coffee. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very crazy idea, and he's got a lot of people chasing him because whereas, you know, seven years ago, people thought that he was insane. So, so I think that the, the, the sort of uh, the, the most compelling thing that you can do is, is make something really work. And then kind of the world is your oyster, right? You can, you can dictate your terms. Um, I was cutting you off, and then this woman um, holding her hand extremely straight uh, has yeah. a question. <laughs> we'll remember you. But um, wait, did you want me to talk? Or? I don't care. Oh, OK. I, mean, I wasn't sure if you were looking at me or not. Um, I did want to say one thing, which is that I, just in the limited conversations I've had with investors, even people who are social investors, I feel like a lot of them are unwilling to uh, invest in something where there's a capped return, a fixed return, or yeah. where, where the uh, involvement in decision making is pretty curtailed. But for 
a social enterprise to truly pursue its mission without this constant voice in its head asking it to earn lots of money for it, it's always going to be a battle and it's always going to potentially undermine a mission. And so I really encourage, especially my clients when they're taking any form of investment, is to make sure that the return is capped and, and really set boundaries around that investor's ability to take part in decisions. But investors, like there's just not a culture. Like there, I haven't heard VCs be willing well, it's a different, it's a different, so the short version in my experience is venture capitalist funds are, come from people who are limited partners who actually want, you know, risky returns. So it fits an area of the portfolio that says, you know, what, what in the oil business is wildcatting, you know, like a bunch of stuff isn't going to work, but when you hit it, yeehaw, right? And that is the, the venture model, and, and it's you know, much more explicit. It, it, they need to invest a certain amount of money to, have, to justify a board seat, to have 20% of the company, blah, blah, blah. The, the bottom line is that um, all of those conditions become negotiable if you have something that's irresistible. Um, you might have something that's irresistible broadly, but you don't need that. You know, you don't need to have 400 investors. You probably just need to have one or two. And so the, uh, the whole idea of actually getting clarity around what you want and what you need um, and it will, will help you hone uh, who you want to talk to and what your conditions are. And I think that, you know, Kevin is here. I can see you. Um, who's an investor and has um, corralled a, a group of thousands of impact investors over the last 10 or so years. And I think that um, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is that there's, there's, there are as many investors as there are entrepreneurs in terms of flavors. And if you, if you, what you say is compelling to someone, you might be surprised at the degree to which they're willing to work with you. If you have a big fund where there's not so many degrees of freedom and there's a lot of limited partners and there's a lot of you know, certain structured uh, expectations, it becomes much more difficult. Um, so, and I think there's great examples like, for example, Lyft, which started off as Zimride, um, got some funding, couldn't get funding, realized the business model wasn't working, did a massive pivot and relaunched his lift and has raised over $300 million is, is, is an absurdly ridiculous example. Um, not, I'm not, again, trying to amplify the things that raise the most money, but more I'm making a comment about the two founders and their capacity to continue to be relentlessly focused, and they're still focused on their original vision. They simply pivoted to actually accommodate what the market was demanding rather than what they were trying to provoke. So, uh, the, yes, the woman who's patient with the microphone. Yes, I, I have two questions related to the uh, co-op T Corporation. So is the T Corporation, is that like closer to a C Corporation or a nonprofit? Like could ultimately go public? That's my first question. You know, could it do a public or DPO type of a thing? Okay. Oh. Well, so in answer to that, so T Corporation, it refers to a section of the Internal Revenue Code in the same way that C Corporation is subsection C and S Corporation right. is subsection S. But the benefit of being a T Corporation is that you, uh, you don't get doubly taxed. So the corporation doesn't pay taxes if it distributes or allocates its earnings to its members on the basis of their patronage. But one of the, the keys to being a T Corporation is that the... Um, that the earnings have to be distributed on the basis of patronage and not on the basis of people's capital contributions. So that really, that's kind of the opposite of going public and seeking capital. And so yeah. Okay, so really that's fit. not that's not a, a possibility. There's no yeah. ex that kind of an exit for a T corporation. Then. Yeah, I mean there have been T corporations where the members have seen it to be in their benefit to sell it because they've been so successful. So there was a farmers cooperative in North Dakota. I guess it's Dakota Growers. It was big pasta making cooperative, and then there is Good Vibrations, the co worker owned cooperative here in the Bay Area. They both sold out to larger companies because in that case the members saw this potential to get a big return in that moment. But as, as a general rule, hopefully co-ops won't do that because in the same way that they have to distribute their earnings based on patronage, they need to distribute the proceeds of like a sale. 
uh, on the basis of patronage, which often requires them to distribute some to past members on the basis of the past members' contribution to overall patronage. So, but can I okay, ask so, why? So, my question, second question is related to uh, raising money potentially for a co op. <laughs> so, I understand, like, once you have an infrastructure and, you know, once possibly you have people put money in who are members, right? Is there usually typical possibility of raising money from outside of uh, a, a, a co-op's members? Is that typical? Mm -hmm. It's not typical, but it's possible. And what you have to do is limit the investor's return, since the law really says the proceeds have to be distributed on the basis of patronage. If you bring in, if you get some, you could call them preferred shares, you could pay a reasonable return, like 3 to 5% every year on those, those shares, but you can't give them a share of the profits based on how much you're earning. So Equal Exchange, which made that chocolate that I passed around earlier, they have preferred shareholders who invested significant amount of money, and now they're getting, I think, 5% every year. They don't get to take part in the votes, or they don't get any more than one vote, but, um, but I think it's been pretty good for them. OK, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Yes. The Woman in the front. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lily. And Janelle, I really have a question for you. You said something earlier about um, when wealth flows, it grows. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about kind of the ecosystem of, I'm not sure exactly what. I'd like that to be more defined. Like, what is this ecosystem that keeps on being thrown around? I love that term. And to me, in the ecosystem, what flows is water. And in what I do, it started in the water birthing movement. And water birth actually refers to the emotional fluidity of the woman giving birth and being completely open and completely like melted in her emotional icebergs and able to open in order to allow the cervix to open and give birth gracefully and in power. So this is my line of work and what we teach. And people that we are working with resonate deeply with this flow and this spiral of movement. And we have <laughs> no translation for how to work with money. Mm. Well, I really love using water as a metaphor when I talk about money, because really, money is not a thing of inherent value. It only has value because people want to take it from you. And it flows from one person to another. So if there was only $1 in this room, we could make it into $100 if we just exchange over and over again. So um, it's really money is kind of it's a system to incentivize flow of services, flow of goods, people providing for each other. And so even if the 80% the of society is only working with a small amount of wealth to begin with, if we can just keep circulating and circulating that wealth, it will just grow regardless of what other wealth has accumulated in the other sectors of society. So my question really is, how do I implement that in a working, viable business model? Do you want to? I would just say, this is probably going, going to go deep enough into a conversation that you guys, don't you think this is like I'm right always happy to talk of, about flow and, yeah. So um, I mean, you might want to connect with Janelle separately, because um, this Sustainable um, Economies Law Center is, is um, I think you've amplified the concept and actually built some tools and things beyond just consultation that are quite good for kind of explicating some of the core aspects of the, the ideas that you're heading in the direction of. Yeah. Um, the, if, we, if we take the time to answer now, I think we're going to go into pretty technical conversation. Sure. Oh, but maybe um, I will say one thing. You know how say one thing. in California the rivers are all dammed up into these concrete culverts that just send the water straight down. They don't get to flow here or flow there or create wetlands or anything like that. That's kind of like our economy. It's all set up to make money just flow in one direction and one direction only. And, and there's so many ways to create new currencies, new types of organizations that incentivize flow in different directions. And I think that is a lot of what we're talking about. So a quick question to, to all of you here is, um, how many people who are here and, and quietly or not so quietly creating uh, ventures um, are thinking about the cooperative model as a potential structure? Anyone? OK. And, yeah. and then 
How many of you are thinking about um, grants or uh, winning the lottery or walking up and down 101 with a sandwich board? Like some other model, but not venture capital. OK. So I'm curious of the people who are thinking about um, cooperatives. Is anybody willing to share sort of the general idea of the business, just so we get a sense of, of how it fits? Because I think that one of the things that happens, um, for example, is a lot of like, so, you know, it would hard, be hard, for me, it's hard to imagine like other machine as a cooperative. Yeah. Um, I think, but easier I think, for your company. I think part, part of it depends on what is it that you're doing and what are like the upfront capital costs and the yeah. infrastructure you got to put in place. For hardware development, we need a manufacturing cell. So there's a lot of stuff that has to happen on dollars before anything gets made. And so I think for that, it would have to be like a very, very large cooperative that was kind of hands off in a way, mm -hmm. um, sort of participating in like, I like the fact that this is happening, but not, yeah. not much like, not like a food cooperative or. Could be the manufacturer's cooperative worker co-op. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe the people. I mean, the other thing there. with cooperatives is that it, it's when you're competing with a VC-funded company, if you do a face-off in time, you know, the VC-funded company ha has a lot more capital and can execute much faster um, than, than a, a cooperative in general from a capital perspective. Um, un unless I, you know, the ones that I'm familiar with, I would say that's the situation. And so part of it also is when you're in a very competitive industry, um, it's hard to imagine, and, and also when the life cycle of the industry isn't mature yet, it, it's hard to imagine how a co-op could, could actually compete. Can I also offer, I think maybe, um, there might be even broader sense of the word co-op. We're using it in a very traditional sense, employee-owned, very economic-based. I think for our company, um, we see it in kind of three different ways. One is, uh, is, there, is it readily accessible to people who want to use it? Are we giving communities exactly what they want? And are we helping and relying on the help of other entrepreneurs to further our business and further theirs? I think those are all elements of a cooperative um, that aren't based in mutual or, or you know, multiple ownership of a single business, which may not lend itself well to every business structure. And so like for me, the share economy or the mesh is very much about helping one another, integrating into one another, and making that accessible, the fruits of those labors accessible to others. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that other machine companies started as a part of other lab. So other lab is actually probably a lot like a co-op in a yeah. way. So it is a place that exists, a building in the mission, which has industrial manufacturing tools. And so by paying rent, essentially, in this building, we got access to things and we didn't have to pay for large scale you know, manufacturing equipment A in the access, beginning. Access, right? Access it was access, yeah. So I think in that way, maybe we did begin a little bit like a co-op. But when it became clear that we needed to, to raise money, essentially larger money to do things on our own, we couldn't. We couldn't stay that way. fund it that way. Yeah. And this reminds me, um, do, I don't know if you all know Kevin Jones. Um, but Kevin, you know, I have a question for you. I don't know if, if the microphone's around. Um, but which is, you know, you have the hub, which is a co-working space. Uh, I work out of there, and a lot of people in, around the world work out of a hub. Um, you know, have you ever considered the, a model where you take, I know you have Hub Ventures as well, but have you considered a model where like we all own the the hub and some other structure other than this sort of standard co-working model? Well, we have raised some money with some expectations by some investors with a different model, so we'd have to work on that convertible debt to equity, et cetera. We did invest in root capital, which invests in co-ops, and we tried to invest in equal exchange. And we would agree with their limit on, on return. And they and we agreed on what they'd done best, which was this, this unique project that increased demand in the city of Cleveland by 30%. 
and that was like a one-off grant. But they, they, you know, they, they did all the things that Fair Trade USA would do if they were an efficient nonprofit, and they, they, they increased demand in Cleveland. <clears throat> and so we agreed that, that increasing demand was the best thing they'd done, and we could fund the growth of demand. And they said, yes, but we can't listen to you. And since it's your idea, you, we can't do it. And so we weren't able to invest in them, even though we were going to accept a 5% return. And you know, But if we'd increased demand 30% in 50 cities, it would have been a you know, much bigger deal than they ever did. And they were not able to take that growth, because they could not imagine new and disruptive ways to create demand. They could do an efficient product. But it's really hard for co-ops to think of something that is potentially new and disruptive business model mm. that doesn't deal with manufacturing and sales, because that's what the consensus did. We weren't able to, we agreed on what forward should be, but they couldn't agree that they could go there listening to us. OK. That may be too complicated, but we really tried to. Equal Exchange was a great co-op. They just couldn't agree that we could be part of what's new. So you, I mean, essentially what you're saying is that it's a two-way street. Like, there are investors that would be keen to invest with a fixed return into a cooperative that has a positive impact, but some, it has to be a two-way match. The, in this for case, the co-op. investors, yeah, we're doing it for the story, and you can't shut us up. That's just part of the deal. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else? Comments, questions? Yes. Um, in the middle, sort of-ish. Towards the back. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I would love to hear um, how do you think about the cost of doing a crowdfunding campaign and how to make the decision to do it? Maybe for Daniel. Uh, yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> it's you got intense. to twitch. So yeah. there's two there's two things that I now realize about it. One is. Um, it's an amazing way to get a window into what a market could look like or in what, not necessarily a market, but just a group of people and it's really the seed of your community. Like if you're doing a project or starting a company or whatever. And that is really a beautiful thing to have access to. You know, it's, you know, and sometimes it's 600 people who are angry with you or 600 people who are giving you feedback because they love what you do. And that is amazing. And I don't even know how to quantify like how valuable that has been to us, but it's been very valuable. On the other hand, you're, you're starting a company in public. Like Every single decision that we have made as a company every two weeks has been communicated with a group of people. It's sometimes embarrassing <laughs> when you make a mistake because it's very out there. Uh, and there's no way to turn it off. Like once you do a crowdfunding campaign and you have made promises, there's no going back, in my opinion. And so it should be taken really seriously. Um, it's my opinion, actually, that uh, people often underestimate the amount of manpower that you need to do it. I mean, to be honest, had we not raised more money, we would be giving back people's money, in, in fact, um, because it turned out that it actually cost more than $1,500 to make a machine. <laughs> and that's what we had estimated before we even knew what we were getting into. Granted, our project is pretty complicated, but I think that there's, there's an expectation of a price of participation in a Kickstarter campaign by an individual, and there's what things actually cost. And I think that there's a mismatch. Like Things actually cost way more um, than when you support them on Kickstarter. Like for example, if I was going to have a Kickstarter campaign where I sold a wallet or something, like, you know, people have the expectation that they can get this wallet for 50 bucks because that's what they would go to the store and buy a thing for. But when I'm making it by hand, maybe like $200 or something like that. So I think there's like disparity in price. There's a, there's a lot of pressure and there's no way of knowing how much something's gonna cost until you get into it. And so you're setting yourself up for a lot of trouble if you don't have a lot of support. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of horror stories about Kickstarter. However, without Kickstarter, we would, I wouldn't be here. Um, and that's, so I mean, there is a way to make it work, but it's, it is a serious decision, it's, it's I think. It's one of those things that like, so the test question is, would you do it again? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, a lot of the people that I, I've, a lot of the companies I've worked with have done, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, some crowdfunding campaign. 
Um, and everybody says the same thing. You get like um, the childbirth answers of like, oh my God, if somebody would have told me. <laughs> You know, but then a year after the kids running around, people forget and they, they, they have another kid. So um, it's the same with crowdfunding, apparently. Um, and, I, and what I, the, the general themes are, I think people have universally said it's an enormous amount of work. Um, it's a public display of, you know, whatever's going on is very conspicuous. Um, but it also kicks you in the butt to get going and there's no turning back. Like once you once you push yes, you're you're now it's now happening. So one of the companies um, that uh, is I didn't think to bring him here, but um, is called Open ROV, and it's a uh, open source underwater robot. And it was a crazy idea, and they basically uh, attach a camera to a, a, this little robot, and it's a submersive, and, and they've launched a whole international community that is a now openexplorer.com. And it's crazy. And it, it all started uh, from a Maker Fair and, and a Kickstarter campaign. So I think, you know, again, um, this, these guys are, they live and breathe their community. And their original Kickstarter community are the people who actually are in the field all over the world putting these submersives into, uh, you know, lakes. And they found like a shipwreck in Lake Tahoe. and all over the world taking samples of water, testing, you know, toxins and doing all sorts of things. So, you know, I think, and I, I think it's probably true with my, maybe the exception of me, who that's my actual uh, mill over there. Um, but for, for most people who are, who got these, I mean, I'm assuming that you're in touch with them and they've started mm -hmm. to build stuff and... Yeah, I mean, I think of Kickstarter as it's how much would you pay for advertising because it's the best advertising for a company that has no name. Um, and also, it's community building. So you're going to create really strong bonds for that. And for me, it was worth it. Um, but it's a serious decision. Serious stuff. Plus, if you didn't sell any, you would know that there was no yeah, market for yeah, it. Yeah, no, nobody was going to get a CC after a failed Kickstarter. So it was kind of all or nothing for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. I call it pre-commerce because you actually sell the thing before you have the mm -hmm. thing, and really before you even know what the hell it is. Mm -hmm. So, it's a leap of faith. But um, you know, it's a leap of faith for being an entrepreneur because Janelle, your story isn't that much different. You sold something before you built it, right? And you have to really listen to the feedback of what makes sense for that community. And we actually try to just lower the barrier to entry to make it accessible and you know, waive our fees so that communities could use it so that we would get real-time feedback and understand exactly what was relevant for a community or a group of people. Uh, one, one comment, is, and then I want each of you to close on something, but um, is just that in general, I think you'll discover, if you haven't already, and I suspect you have, that things cost more and take longer than you, think, than you, than you thought they would. Um, and that's kind of a universal truth. Uh, so, you know, in, in all these experiments, I think there's no exception. Um, is there anybody else who has a burning question? Otherwise, I'm going to ask these, these generous people to, um, to make a quick closing comment. So if there was one thing that one you were going to kind of... Oh, we do? Mm -hmm. Cool. Who is it? Hi. I'm uh, oh, Monty Cosmo. I have a quick burning question. I Great. hope it's quick. Um, so uh, I work with Casey Fenton on a couple of his new projects. He was the founder of Couchsurfing, and we're looking at some interesting ways of creating incentives around participants in the sharing economy. Yep. In the past, one of the things that I've worked on doing kind of economics and market design is revenue sharing. So for example, participants uh, in the system could take money out for a transaction. This was in the context of uh, independent film licensing where we had a subscription fee, and we basically took 50% of our subscription revenues and allocated that among uh, creators to incentivize them to come and participate. My question is, when you're talking about um, co-ops, what are the advantages or disadvantages of actually sharing ownership uh, with participants in the market versus simply having you know, a revenue share or something like that, where they're incentivized to participate, but without the element of control? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, the cool thing about ownership is that it's not a thing. It's a bundle of rights. That's what we learned in law school. And so with every company, you can just decide what 
bundle of rights do you want to keep for yourself and what do you want to share? And so for some people, participa participation in ongoing decision making or election of the board, maybe that won't matter at all. Maybe the real incentive is being able to earn a little passive income through uh, the investment. Um, it could be a wide variety of things that you offer to share with people or to get their feedback. And so you could set it up where they own it, or you can just make an agreement with them, like you were saying, like, you provide this money, we will share this amount of revenue from you. Maybe we'll even get your input on this decision and that decision, but you can still maintain the ownership yourself. So I think, I think the possibilities are pretty endless. Does that answer your question? Is that fair? Who was the person who asked the? Okay, cool. So did did that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, so we're we're going to do a quick like lightning round. Um, la you know, what would you want to leave these people with in in terms of the 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 topic at hand? You know, thinking about building a company, investment, and exits. Right. I think um, the best thing about way the way we look at the share economy in our company. Uh, is to look at investing in people. And I think as entrepreneurs, whether you are a first time or a serial entrepreneur, the best thing that you can do is to share your ideas with others and to actually help somebody when they ask for it. Because you know, whether you're looking for new funding or you've already done it before, you don't need to recreate the wheel when these, uh, when these same topics keep coming up. And so I think um, as an attorney, I also feel there's lots of different structures uh, that you can explore in the share economy. And, you, you'll have to actually go through several iterations to figure out what's right for you, S Corp, C Corp, whatever it might be. You know, what type of uh, funding you take on. It could be debt financing, convertible note, it could be VC funding. You're not going to know right now, and that's okay. But if you do want to do something, you want to feel like you're moving forward and taking action, because that's what all of us entrepreneurs feel like. If we're not moving forward, we feel like we're moving backwards. Um, help each other. That's the best thing that you can do, because you're going to learn so much from one another. You might find you don't need to recreate every little piece of it. Uh, yeah, the thing that I would say is, you know, as more people and more businesses start up and I guess basically across the board margins kind of start to get lower but between different companies, the only thing that really matters is the relationship that you have with your customers. So I think that that, um, I mean, I just, I still think that's the most important thing. Um, so no matter where funding comes from or whatever, how slow you have to grow your company, if you make the right decisions and you really develop relationships with your companies, at least you've got that at the end of the day, no matter how big your company grows. I guess my last thought is life is short. The ice caps are melting. There's a lot of crap happening. So don't compromise anything at this point. If you have the opportunity to carry forth your vision or compromise it by taking funding that you really don't want. Just don't compromise it. And there's so much capital out there. It's just in this silly place called Wall Street. But I think you know, as we raise people's consciousness about what happens with their money when it goes there, more people are going to start taking it out and investing it in a diverse portfolio of local businesses that are actually going to make their future a lot better. Um, I would just close by saying I think that one of the main things that's fueling a lot of what's happening and the velocity of it, including conversations like this and the peers event, I mean, peers and SOCAP event of SHARE to begin with, is this culture of generosity. And I think that um, you will find, as, as I have found, and these people have been very generous with us, um, that in general, people are very generous about you know, what worked and didn't work, um, what, I, what I would do again, how I would do it differently. I like to ask myself the question of, if I was starting from today, knowing what I now know, what would I do? Because I find that a lot of times we continue to do things because we've, we're doing them, as opposed to stopping for a minute and say, like, hang on one second, you know, do I actually want to continue down this path or should I turn this off and start a different project or start this a different way. Um, I agree that the life is short. And yes, the ice caps are melting. Um, but you know, the chance for us to create something together, um, the DIT, you know, do it together, uh, and do it uh, in a kind of shareable, rapid, collaborative way is, to me, really exciting. Uh, I hope that you guys move forward with your ventures and explore new ways to, or old ways in some cases, to um, to fund and create really sustainable 
successful businesses. Um, thanks for your time. And these guys will be around for a few minutes. But thanks to each of you for participating. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.